So I hear that the uh, museum at the APS is open this afternoon. But I also took to heart what Mr. Rubenstein said about selling your ideas. So I want to uh, use this uh, slide to do a public service announcement about the exhibition at the, my museum, which is the Philadelphia Museum of Art on the Parkway, where we are um, presenting through the end of January an exhibition entitled Matisse in the 1930s, and that's what I'm here to talk about. It's a collaboration with the Musée de l'Orangerie and the Musée Matisse Nice, as, uh, as we heard. The slide here shows uh, the artist Matisse with uh, a great painted decoration that he made in the early 1930s called The Dance for the Barnes Foundation, then located just outside of Philadelphia. This is actually a photo taken, however, in the uh, um, empty automobile garage that he uh, took over near his studio in the city of Nice in order to paint this 45-foot wide mural. And I like it because uh, the, sh the shadow is set up so that the artist is looking up at the lady in the painting. We began this project five years ago with my colleagues in France with the idea of making the first exhibition that would deal with a transformative decade in the career of Henri Matisse, transformative how, a time when he reassessed his subjects, expanded his techniques and materials, and deepened his thinking about his artistic method. The catal catalyst for all this, in many ways, was the Barnes dance that I was showing. And I'm showing you now, on the left, a photograph of Albert Barnes, the patron, and Henri Matisse, the artist. Barnes is on the left, standing in front of a painting by uh, a painter whom Matisse uh, admired greatly, Renoir, uh, in the Barnes Foundation Gallery in 1930, which is the year that they met. Um, This project has allowed me to think uh, broadly about, about uh, this decade in the work of Matisse, but it's also allowed me to think about his connections to Philadelphia. The first recorded sighting of a Matisse in Philadelphia was an exhibition of innovative modern art at, the, at a gallery called the McLeese Galleries, then located in Center City at 14th and Chestnut in May 1916. And there were two Matisse pictures recorded in the, in the, uh, um, in the hand list. The story of Matisse in Philadelphia really gets going with Barnes. This city had its first glimpse of his collection through an exhibition in 1923 hosted at, the, uh, at PAFA uh, two years before the opening of his foundation in 1923. It featured five Matisses, including Joy of Life, the great Arcadian composition of 1906. It's there on the slide on the right. You can't see this, but in the far uh, middle ground, the Ring of Dancing Figures. Here you see it on display where it used to be in the stairwell when the Barnes Foundation was located in its original building in Marion before it was moved to the parkway where now it, the painting it occupies a mezzanine. And yet, Matisse's recognition and patronage in Philadelphia is a story of not one but two institutions. The Philadelphia Museum of Art, PMA, began in its modern incarnation in 1928, and its inaugural exhibition featured two Matisses on loan from Samuel S. and Vera White. Uh, ultimately, it was through gifts from them and other collectors that PMA acquired its substantial Matisse holdings, which are part of the reason why it was important that the exhibition currently on view be here, and we are the only U.S. venue. This picture, which was one of those in the first show in 1928 from the White Collection, 1917, gives us an entry into the storyline. 1917, Matisse shifts his base of operations from Paris to Nice. For about 10 years, he mainly paints the spaces where he lives and works, the control setting of the studio, and focuses on the visual pleasure of the soft Mediterranean light falling on and helping to model and give a certain kind of depth to the rooms, the objects in them, and the forms of the hired female models with whom he works in daily painting sessions. There's a strong connection between the subject matter, which is uh, evocative depictions of the interior, and the underlying aim, which is to serve as an expression of perceptions, moods, emotions, interiority, our interior world. The first section of our exhibition it takes a running start on the story by um, going back to the the 10 years or so after he moved to Nice and really carefully tracing the way in which his work explored that, those themes that I just mentioned a minute ago. You may be wondering, though, why does this guy begin 
an exhibition called Matisse in the 1930s by looking in uh, his work in the uh, period before. It's to signpost some interrelated issues that run through the exhibition and which are shown in this picture, including the primacy for Matisse of the human figure, the focus on sensuality in the interplay of the figure with its setting, and the concept of decoration as the baseline of his art. The idea that whether it's a still life landscape or a human figure, a picture is most evocative, most resonant, hits you in your mind or in your heart, the extent to which uh, all of the relationships of, of form, space, shape, color, and so forth are integrated into a whole. By the end of the 20s, Matisse thought that that vein of intimate uh, uh, style painting had run out, and that's where the Barnes Commission comes in. Matisse visits uh, Marion in the fall of 1930. Barnes offers him a commission on the spot to decorate the main gallery of the building. That's the slide you're seeing on the right. Barnes wants a capstone for his collection by the artist who he considers the most important living embodiment of the French modern art tradition. Matisse, who feels stuck in his work, wants to uh, lay the foundations for what may come next in his career. We tell the story of the Barnes uh, mural through a big wall of sketches and studies that allow us to trace the genesis of the project, and also an extraordinary 11-foot tall, that is, to scale drawing of a central dancing figure, an extraordinary, and that's the work on the left, loan from our exhibition partner in Nice. That loan of the 11-foot tall drawing helps us to make a larger point. Matisse made a distinction between easel pictures, portable easel pictures, and large-scale architectural painting, and he worked it out at this moment. He thought of easel pictures as closed worlds, isolated from the milieu by their frames. And painted decoration is like, like the project that was going to change things for him as the opposite principle, works to animate a place. He spoke of the Barnes Dance, which occupies a very strange space, 45 feet across over three uh, French windows with light coming in from a garden and three arches above in the ceiling. He spoke of it like a pediment on a cathedral porch an analogy that underlined his idea of the total integration of the image with its setting as something of paramount importance. So we trace all this, and then we show how, though Matisse did feel that the Barnes mural helped him to solve some problems, it took him a little while to figure out the direction of his work, and he found it in 1935 when he set up a daily working routine with a model named Lydia Delectorskaya, a Russian immigrant, uh, who became his his key model, assistant, secretary, muse uh, for the rest of the decade. This is the great loan from the Baltimore Museum of Art to Cone Collection. Large reclining nude, begins with a standard pose of the woman with her elbow up uh, and a, um, a bouquet and a wall on diagonal, and ended up with a, a, a kind of picture that moved away from a style of refinement, and this is how Matisse characterized the decade that came before to a new style of bold, flat shapes and bright, unshaded colors. We also ask, why is it that in his moment of his breakthrough, when he came back to productivity and easel painting, did he so often paint the female nude figure uh, and take it as his primary subject? For him, in some sense, his artistry did not really exist without the model. The direct presence of the model um, he needed, and he spent a couple of years in a series of paintings and drawings, which we exhibit, uh, making an extended inquiry into the nature of his, his own artistry through the model. But he thought it wasn't enough to record what he saw in front of him. What he needed to do was to divert, divert visual attention from the details of the body and even the sensuality of the body into the sensuality of the materials and the composition as a whole. Now, whether or not that process, which you can see in this comparison of this great painting in Baltimore and the drawing that everybody loves in the exhibition, great um, reclining nude from the Museum of Modern Art, whether or not this process was yet another way to see the female form as an object, or to reimagine its presence as a work of art, or both, was an issue then and is an issue now, and we um, raise it uh, for our audience in the exhibition. Moving on. Each gallery looks at a different facet of this, this phase in Matisse, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very precise way, so that we can narrate the story for our audience. If the premise is that the Barnes mural changed the direction of Matisse's work in the mid-30s, did he just give up on large-scale, architecturally-oriented formats afterwards? No. 
He lost little time in engaging with decorative formats beyond the scope of portable easel pictures. And the opportunity was a commission which produced the painting on the uh, left called Tahiti One in 1935 from a decorative arts entrepreneur who was uh, hire, uh, commissioning artists like Matisse to provide cartoons or full-scale painted models for tapestries because she was hoping to revive the old French tapestry industry with these new designs. As a type of mobile mural or architectural decoration, tapestry seemed a natural fit for Matisse's ideas about the decorative image. And so he made this picture of a boat in the harbor in the capital of Tahiti, where he had gone to get away from himself when he was at a low point in 1930 and feeling unproductive as a painter before um, the change that we described in the exhibition. And then he made a second version to make a kind of experiment in the rendering of the, of the motif. This is a thing he did often, um, repainting, re-sculpting, redrawing something in order to test out its expression in, in a different medium. And that's another one of the facets that we looked uh, at very carefully in the show. Now, Matisse um, only sent these pseudo uh, tapestry paintings out for exhibition once in, in 1936 at his, dealer, his dealer's gallery in Paris. They took him back to a studio where they became part of the decor of his own environment and where they became uh, touchstones for him, for his own contemplation. They also had a second life because they started popping up in the backgrounds of further paintings. And that takes us to a large gallery, which um, takes you to the end of the decade, where you again are with the model, again in the studio, but now she wears a variety of highly decorated garments that Matisse kept as studio paraphernalia uh, and, and posed uh, them in and used the, dec the, the various kinds of either vegetal or other kinds of geometrical decoration and the shapes of these garments to further uh, his pictorial experiment in the 30s. This is sort of the fashion section of the exhibition, and you're looking at a drawing from St. Louis, uh, and then a great work in our collection called Woman in Blue, which is more or less Matisse's version of an Ang portrait, the most stately kind of uh, depiction of a woman uh, in, a, in, a, in a skirt, which the model, Lydia, actually um, uh, sewed at his request as a posing skirt. And it allows us to, to move forward the argument that we're making in the exhibition. It's accurate, but insufficient to say that Matisse moved toward a style of bold, flat shapes and bright, unshaded colors in the wake of the Barnes mural, and that, it, that did wake up uh, in some way his art. He moved toward a new clarity of design, or maximum impact of form and space. But it's insufficient, because each picture was another experiment in, um, in, in varying the, the language that uh, he used to, he applied to the subject. He spoke of his pictures as having a sign-like character, by which he meant, that though there was always a certain representational link to what he was looking at in the studio, what was right before him, usually, finally the picture had to be a world apart defined by the highly organized pictorial energies of, let's say, the flat uh, shapes of the dress, the settee, the black uh, tile floor, which magically pulls up to create a counter curve, the red wall, which was not red in reality, or the pictures on the wall, and the bouquet, which makes a kind of halo for the woman there. Each of the pictures in the large series of fashion plates, Matisse fashion plates in the last large section of the exhibition, explores a different relationship of depth and flatness, or schematization of faces, figures, and objects, and that's what makes it exciting. By the time I get to the end of that section, we're in 1940, it's time for me to find a way to end the story. There's a small section about a wonderful collaboration that Matisse did in 1937 and 38, with the Ballet Luce de Monte Carlo Modern Dance Company, where he went back to the subject of the dance mural in a new creative context, which helps me to, to refer back to uh, the, the picture that animates the beginning of the show and make a, a logical sort of story for the audience. That you'll have to come see in the exhibition because we present for the first time uh, a film of, of this ballet with sets and costumes by Matisse, choreography by Leonie Massine, director of the Ballet Russe then, uh, in an exhibition. The final gallery ends the story by picking up a major turning point in Matisse's life when, nearly 70 years of age, uh, or just about 70 years of age, as after World War II breaks out, he's in his studio in Nice. He intends to keep working through it all, 
but falls ill. In uh, the spring of 41, he goes through a risky but life-saving surgery for abdominal cancer, survives, comes back, feels he has a second life. That's a turning point that we use to end the story just as we begin the story with a turning point. In recuperation, he concentrates on drawing, lots of drawings. The result is a series called The Themes and Variations, where you, you begin with a charcoal drawing to learn the motif, and then he keeps going with X number of line drawings, unshaded, pure, in pencil or pen, where he's no longer referring to the model so much, but, refer, but, but in a chain of references from one drawing to the next until his inspiration is, is worn out. Matisse used this series and published them in the depths of the war as a demonstration of where he was as an artist as the 30s turned to the 40s. And I'm glad to say that we were able to get two complete sets of these drawings. This one is from the museum in Lyon which typify that typically Matissean duality between deliberate observation and the translation of the person, place, or thing into an abbreviated, magnified, dynamic arrangement. And that helps me close the story. I'll close what I have to say here. I'm coming back to the framing that I began um, these remarks with, Matisse in Philadelphia. In 1948, our museum did what was then the largest Matisse retrospective ever to be presented in the United States, so a continuation of the story of the presentation and recognition of Matisse in this city. You're looking at the exhibition entrance off of the uh, Great Stair Hall and the woman in blue and other pictures of the 40s on the right. Matisse uh, sent a large number of works for this exhibition. He worked with the curator, Henry Clifford, and he sent Clifford uh, an essay in French from the previous year called Exactitude is Not Truth, which he asked to be translated in the catalog. The premise of this... Uh, essay is that any observed motif has an inherent or essential truth that the painter, painter brings forth by inventing pictorial signs for observed forms in nature. And he had published a quartet of self-portrait sketches alongside the essay, each one ostensibly showing a different facet of the subject, his own character. Matisse concluded his remarks with a phrase, Borrowed from, the painter of one, uh, borrowed from the painter Eugène Delacroix, one of his idols, uh, that served not only as the title, but also as a credo, exactitude is not truth. And that is more or less the motto for the exhibition. And again, I will step out of the, the discussion to say, if you're still in town this weekend, come to the museum. Thank you very much. Hi, so of course I can vouch because I heard we were at the exhibition early Thursday before coming here, so I want a second. Uh, my question comes, the Museum of Modern Art had the Red Room Matisse exhibit, and at least as they tell the story in the 1912s and 14s, while the Rus Russian co collectors understood the genius of Matisse, Americans uh, he was left cold by at least some of the American collectors did not see the brilliance of the Red Room and some other Matisses. So I just wanted to invite your commentary on the reception of Matisse, Russia, the United States, France, and uh, how he, how he, why he was seen in which context, in which way, as we now appreciate and thank you for your wonderful curating his uh, amazing art. Thank you for the question. It's a very, that's a very big question. It's very interesting. Uh, and I also have to thank my colleagues and my friends at the Museum of Modern Art because their wonderful Red Studio exhibition was a great... Uh, we, uh, we're, we're riding their coattails uh, and continuing the story in a certain sense. I would say that the uh, generation of, of people who became great collectors of Matisse in the United States got the religion of modern art around 1916, 1917, in the period actually when the first Matisses were shown here. It's really a phenomenon that happens a little bit later, but you have a whole group of the people who founded the Museum of Modern Art and Barnes uh, and, and others in Philadelphia and Louise and Walter Ahrensberg, who are great collectors of modern art, gave their collection to our museum in 1950 and put us on the map of modern art at the PMA forever with that act, right? So it was really a, a question of a generation that came of age as collectors around World War I, around 1917 or so, and then proceeded on. 
And what's interesting for Matisse, of course, is that, yes, he had great Russian collectors before the war. That wasn't possible anymore after the war. So really, the Americans, in some sense, took the, took the baton, also the great Danish collectors before the war. And Barnes bought many of important Matisse's from those very people and brought them to the States. Matisse was very well collected in the U.S. in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and he had his apotheosis in the U.S. really after World War II, and the exhibition that our museum did in 48 was one of the events that helped to create that apotheosis. And so I would just say this is part of a much larger question of the collecting of modern art, and the legacy of it is partly, um, partly here. Shreve Simpson, Philadelphia. We heard a wonderful talk yesterday about what an earlier French visitor to Philadelphia, Tocqueville, thought about Philadelphia. What did Matisse think about Philadelphia? I don't think we have as much evidence for Matisse's thoughts about Philadelphia. He, like many French modern artists, uh, was very excited um, by aspects of the United States. Uh, skyscrapers, which were not a thing in Paris in his day. The wide open spaces, he traveled across the country on his way to Tahiti. Uh, went to San Francisco, Los Angeles. So in a way, he, we have some things that he says which are the things that you expect some, a visitor to say about the States, about its size, about its bigness. He, he liked the, the light of New York, he, the, the northern light, I think. It was, it was interesting to him, even though he was in Nice. Uh, we, the, the most tantalizing and unfortunately still frustrated element of his response to the U.S. Um, is this. Uh, there, uh, there, there is some evidence published, but not footnoted, unfortunately, in a wonderful exhibition catalog of a great Matisse show at the Museum of Modern Art some years ago, that Rene Darnancourt, the father of Anne Darnancourt and the president of the MoMA, eventually, may have taken Matisse to a baseball game in Philadelphia when Matisse was here in 1930. <laughs> And to me, this, that whole question comes very close to the closest thing I have to a religion, personally. So I really followed this up. Uh, the trouble is there were two Major League Baseball teams in Philadelphia then, the Phillies and the A's. The A's moved on to Kansas City and then Oakland. And I have actually have people, I have friends trying to look into the Ardarnancourt archives at MoMA to figure out if it, it, what, what game it was. The trouble is that we also know that Matisse... Uh, didn't understand the, the game, and thought it was too cold, and didn't have a good time. So um, I, I, um, I did mention this to my, my colleagues in marketing, who, since the Phillies were you know, recently very successful, we were ho dying to find the connection, but it was always tricky, and um, we didn't quite get there. Hi, Matthew. Jahan Ramazan. Hi, John. Hi. Great to see you. So sorry we've lost you from the University of Virginia, but you're doing wonderful things here in Philly. I just wanted to ask, um, uh, it was fascinating to, uh, what you had to say about the uh, kind of turn toward more decorative sort of architectural um, kinds of art. And I was just curious, there's been much more attention over the last decade or so to Matisse's interest in Islamic art, particularly, you know, from his early time in North Africa and so forth, um, where, of course, that decorative flat, flattened surfaces and so forth is very important. Does that play a role as late as the 1930s also in his work? It, it plays a huge role, and, I, you know, I, I, I didn't uh, have the time to go into it, but it's a major feature of, of the exhibition also. The whole question of, so Matisse traveled to Morocco and Algeria and Spain, before World War I, and became very activated by Islamic decorative arts, objects, uh, textiles, which pop up in his pictures. And he loved them um, because, he th because he saw a resource that he could import, that is the arabesque line and the repeat patterns, that he could import into his own art in order to do something new in his domain. And we have a whole section, actually the first section is called Interiors and Odalisque, because he also liked to dress up his European models as pseudo Odalisque and, 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 and overfill the, the studio around them so much with patterns that, that you know it's, it's, it's an artifice that he's telling you is an artifice. And that, that makes it even more interesting. Uh, uh, even when he, when, when, when he stopped emphasizing that subject so much in about 1928 and moved on, 
Some of those objects pop up in the pictures. And the, eth the, the sort of artistic ethos, the, the idea of, of um, cross-pollination uh, of traditions is absolutely the ground line of, his, of all his art. And what's interesting is that he's really an omnivore, so he also uses European decorative arts and he gets interested in objects from all over the world. And I would say it's, it's more a question of a creative adaptation than, it, you know, than anything else, which becomes its own thing. And so it's one of the things, thank you for asking, that, that you really get to see in, in our show, and I think it's very important. Okay, James Neal from the Institute of Museum and Library Services in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I, had, I remember reading about this exhibit uh, a few months ago and was like, shucks, it's only in Philly in the United States. So can you please uh, describe the, the thought process or the reasons why the only U.S. exhibition of this great uh, exhibit is in Philly? I, obviously, it's there's a connection to Philadelphia, but why, why other places were not considered as well? Thank it's you. not, it's the, it, the connection to Philadelphia is handy for us, but the show uh, is, is about much broader and wider things. You know, the idea came out of a conversation, all these, these projects come out of your, your discussions with your colleagues. And this exhibition came out, of, uh, this, this, this whole project came out of a conversation between me and my co-curators. Uh, Cécile Debray, then the director of the Orangerie Museum in Paris, now at the Musée Picasso, and Claudine Gramont, the director of the, the, the Nice Matisse Museum, because there are two. There's another one in the north of the country in his hometown. And, you know, the idea was that this had not been done in the museum exhibition before. And, sure, the Philadelphia connection was useful, but it was our, it was our working relationships that made this possible. And, since it, it was these, these three curators uh, who were going to be the co-organizers, it fell to our three institutions to be the hosts of the exhibition. It's going to be in a different version in France when it goes there in, uh, in the winter in the, or in the spring and the summer. And so, you know, I, and I will just follow up on, so that's the simple answer, but I will follow up on, on, your, on your, what you said, but to say that, you know, if, if you take what's at the barns, he had 59 Matisses. And you take what's, what we have, took us five years to assemble uh, easel pictures, large scale architectural scale pictures, prints, drawings, bronzes, posing skirt, uh, and artists, and books. If you are interested in Matisse right now, there is nowhere else to be but Philadelphia. And uh, I will, you know, as a patriotic Philadelphian and also a team player at my museum, uh, I will be very happy to, to make that point to anyone. So thank you for uh, giving me the chance. <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs>